empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. When you came along and put me back together. Yeah. 
is the God who turns seas into highways, who turns bones into armies. He's the God that defeated the grave. And so that's why we worship him this morning. So if you know this, would you sing this out with me? Oh, you're the name above.
this morning. Would you remind us that that is the truth of the gospel, that that is our truth that we can live out, God. Would you remind those that need to hear it that life is worth living because you died. You conquered it all on our behalf so that we could live, God. Would you encourage those hearts that need that this morning? Father, thank you. God, I pray as we continue throughout this gathering that you would eliminate distractions, that you would focus our eyes upon you, upon what you did. We want to hear from you this morning. Would this not just be any ordinary Easter, God, but would your word be made afresh in our hearts and in our minds today, God. We love you and we give you all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, before you're seated, would you turn and greet someone around you? Convoy of Hope believes in the significance of one. One meal that gives a child enough energy to learn in school. One driving passion to feed the world. And one person giving generously can multiply the one to the many. By taking part in One Day to Feed the World, one day's wage can replace poverty and hunger with hope and love. You're helping kids, families, and entire communities on their journey to a brighter futures and hope in Jesus. In the end, it all comes down to one. One day to feed the world. Good morning, Evergreen family. I want to say thanks for making us part of your Easter morning, your Easter celebration. Hopefully uh, your morning has gotten off to a good start. Sunshine, coffee, and we're glad to have you with us this morning. For those watching online into our South Campus, I want to say good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Tyler. I have the honor and privilege of being one of our teaching pastors on staff here. Um, an incredible honor of bringing in today's Easter message. Well, hey, uh, one day to feed the world through Convoy of Hope. We are encouraging and believing for God uh, to do an incredible thing and uh, for us to partner with it. And so we ask that you would pray for, prayerfully consider uh, partnering with Convoy of Hope and 
and seeing God do an incredible thing through our one day uh, where we pledge to give one day's wage uh, to change someone's life for all of eternity. So we'd encourage you to pray on that, consider that, um, and to join in with what God is doing, not just here in our community, but around the world in the lives of children everywhere. Well, hey, I don't know uh, how you do with details. I struggle with them. I struggle remembering details, recounting details. My wife could tell me 15 times throughout the week what we are doing Saturday at 5 p.m., and it will still come as a shock to me Saturday at 4.30. Details for me are really tough to nail down. In fact, we are so polar opposite when it comes to details. Even dreams for her are easy to remember and to bring up details and the account of what she dreamt about. And I think I fall into the 6% of people who don't remember anything they dream. And there are sometimes I wake up thinking that I will be able to remember my dream because it was so vivid and so real and I'll wake up and I'll go to tell it to her and it's gone in a flash. And I can't remember it. And so for those of you who remember your dreams and you can live in that kind of uh, reality, I envy you. Uh, There are dreams I wish I could remember and I just can't. But details are important. Details make or break stories. You know, grandpa's fish that he caught when you were a kid that was this big. And then years later, he was telling the story and it's this big. And then at Thanksgiving, that thing dang near capsized the boat they were fishing on. And it may have been 50 to 75 pounds. Who knows? But details, as some say, are the difference between good and great. And God is in the details. God is a God of details. God is a God of specifics. And you know, when we read scripture, when we go through the Bible, when we go through God's word, there are details in there that we may wrestle with. There are details in there that may seem random or sporadic or out of place. But I can tell you with confidence that God puts every detail in his word for a specific reason. And we're going to get into John chapter 20, the gospel of John and the resurrection account. And as we read through the story, I would encourage you to look for the details put there by God. Now, we have uh, Bibles in the backs of the pews in front of you, and we also will have it up on the screen. Or if you want to pull out your favorite device and bring up the Bible that way, we'd encourage you to bring up God's Word in any way uh, that you you want to this morning. But look for the details. John chapter 20 is where we're going to be at this morning. And uh, we have the habit here of standing when we read God's Word. So if you're willing and able, would you just stand with me as we read John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And this is what it says. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Uh, The other disciple is John, the one writing this story, okay? Just so we all are aware, this is John. The other disciple, whom Jesus loved. Okay. And and she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter, and the other disciple, being John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but check this out. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Here's what I imagine happened, okay? It's not biblical. This is just in my mind. I imagine there was a race at some point in Jesus' ministry where these two disciples were like, bet I could beat you to that rock. And they just took off running, and Peter won. So then when John is telling his story here, he goes, this detail's in here forever. (laughs) Take that, Peter. So John outruns Peter, the faster of the two disciples, and reached the tomb first. Verse 5. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him some 15, 20, 30 minutes later and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the disciple who reached the tomb first, don't forget, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary, somebody say, now Mary. Now Mary Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over, looked into the tomb, and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. 
At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. You may be seated. Oh, God, as we ponder over your word this morning, Lord, I pray that hearts would be moved, Lord, minds would be enlightened, God, that there would be no detail that would escape our attention, Lord, escape our focus. God, we thank you for who you are, your nature, your heart for us. We thank you for the resurrection, and we thank you for your son. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Details matter. Details are important. Now, we're in John chapter 20, but here's what I want you to do. I also want you to flip over to Genesis chapter 3 and try to keep both open. If you want to put a tab in there, if you just want to keep your finger in that part of the Bible. But Genesis chapter 3, we're going to be flipping back and forth because there's going to be details that God wants to bring out in this John chapter 20 account that we're going to go and look at in Genesis chapter 3. So as you turn there, if any of you are note takers, uh, I want to lead off with our big idea for the morning, and that it's this. Redemption began and is fulfilled in the garden. Redemption began and is fulfilled in the garden. Now, this other disciple who was really fast, who Jesus loved, wrote this gospel for a very specific reason. I would encourage you to go back, and we don't have time today, but to John uh, chapter 1 at the very beginning of his gospel, where he starts off with the words, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he talks about how nothing that came into creation was created outside of this Word, which was Jesus. And this kind of gives us the lens through which to look at how John is explaining Jesus in this time. You see, John wanted for us to recognize that Jesus was not just some prophet. He was not just some teacher. He was not just this ethical guru who came to get people to like each other more, but that this was indeed, and in fact, God. In fact, at the end of John chapter 20, he just flat out plainly lays out the reason he wrote this gospel. Look at verse 30. It says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, I might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. John lays it out really plainly. And so as John is tying this in, I mean, the way he opens his gospel is a direct tie back to the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis. In the beginning, he wanted his readers and for us to understand that before there was anything, there was Jesus. And that everything that came into being came through Jesus. And that everything that will come into being is going to come, spoiler alert, through Jesus. And so this is the reason he writes this, so that we might not just be uh, encouraged, but that we might believe and find eternal life in Jesus. So let's look at uh, John chapter 20, verse 11. And if you take notes, okay, I'm a big note taker. I'm going to give you a couple main points to help us uh, break down this message. But the first thing I want you to write down is angels and the entrance. Turn to somebody and say, angels and the entrance. This is different from angels in the outfield. Okay, anybody? Great movie. No, if you haven't seen it, go to Blockbuster, rent a VHS, watch it for movie night tonight. It's a great one. Angels in the entrance, verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels. Somebody say two angels. Two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. You know, this is really interesting. Everything that John does correlates back to the beginning. Now I said, get Genesis chapter 3 ready. So if you've got Genesis chapter 3, I want you to to go back there and find this right now. 
And I want you to look at chapter 23. And maybe if you're not familiar with the story, here's what happens at the beginning. God creates this beautiful paradise of a garden. And he puts in it two people, man and woman, Adam and Eve, and he communes with them in perfect relationship. There's no sin. There's no separation. There's no death. There's no disease. There's no sickness. There is no pain because sin doesn't exist. And so God puts a tree the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, I want you to tend this garden. I want you to care for it. I want you to live here. Just don't eat of this tree. And then because of the deception of a serpent, Eve takes of it, she eats, she passes it to Adam, he eats, and sin enters the scene and into our story. And so God, in his mercy, removes them from the garden. We might think of it as punishment, but here's what God's doing. He says, I don't want you to live forever. I'm going to remove your access to eternal life so you don't have to spend eternity in a fallen state. I don't want you to have to live forever dealing with sin, corruption, and pain. And so he removes man from the garden. And here's what it says in verse 23. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which the man had been taken out. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, which mean angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way, listen, to the tree of life. Not just to the garden, specifically guarding the way back to the tree of life. So Mary comes to the tomb. The stone's been rolled away. The disciples come. They see. The linen are laying there. They leave. And she looks in, and she sees two angels. Adam and Eve, as they are being escorted out of the garden by God, the last thing they see at the gate protecting the way back to the tree of life are two angels and a flaming sword. So this parallel between what what, uh, Mary is seeing as she looks into the tomb and what Adam and Eve see as they look back on access to eternal life are two angels. And I, I, I would like to imagine, I just believe it's the same two angels who show up to usher in a new era, this redemptive story, access back to the tree of eternal life. And what's really interesting, what's missing? A flaming sword. Now, I don't know about you, but I would notice a flaming sword, right? If it would have been two angels and a flaming sword, that would have been, like, that would have been recognizable. She would have been like, and there's this flaming sword. And he'd probably be like, doesn't seem relevant. There was no flaming sword. Why is that? The punishment for sin is death. Swords draw blood. The price for sin had already been paid. There had already been bloodshed. The price had been paid to Telestai. It is finished, said Jesus. And so now, where there was a flaming sword and these two angels to protect the way back to the tree of life and eternal life, now there are just two angels. The sword has been removed. And they're granting humanity back to access through Jesus to a life in reconciliation with God. This is really important. Max Lucado says this, the tomb that sealed the body of Jesus became the womb of our salvation. You see, where sin had thought it had won, Jesus triumphed over. I I love the, the way that John uses language in here. In fact, John's gospel is the only one that starts off this, this account of the resurrection with, while it was still dark. Almost like God at the beginning was waiting to speak the words, let there be light. And there's this anticipation, this moment of darkness where sin thinks it's won. It thinks it has the upper hand. The devil thinks he's triumphed while it was still dark. But there was a moment coming where there would be light spoken in. That eternal life would again be granted to humanity. But not through a garden, not through a tree but through a person, Jesus Christ. Angels and the entrance. The second point, if you're taking notes, is this. Face to face with the gardener. Turn to somebody and say, face to face with the gardener. Face to face with the gardener. Here's what it says in John 20, verse 15. He asked her, he being Jesus, her being Mary, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. Listen, 
not a Roman soldier who were there present at the tomb during this uh, whole ordeal, not one of the other disciples who may have come along to see what had happened, not a Pharisee who may have shown up to disprove that Jesus really wasn't who he said he was. No, she doesn't mistake him for any of those people who would make sense. She mistakes him for a gardener. And she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him that I may go and get him. So she's face to face with Jesus saying, I'm looking for Jesus. Can you tell me where he is? I met, like, I could imagine if somebody asked me that, and I'm just like in anticipation waiting for the big, gotcha, right? Surprise! Unveil. It's me. In Genesis 3, there's a gardener. It's God. What was the first ever responsibility given to man? It was to be a gardener, to tend for and to care for God's creation. Man was specifically called to be a gardener with God. And what's interesting is Jesus knows Mary's name. He says it a little later, but he addresses her as woman, tying back to her original identity in the garden where things were perfect. So he says, woman, right? Genesis 3, 8 through 9, it says this, Then man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, where are you? He answered, I was in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And so I hid. You see, coming face to face with the gardener in the midst of sin was terrifying for humanity. Coming face to face with the gardener when we were riddled and, and had the guilt of shame and, and sin and pain on our shoulders made us run away from God and hide in our own sin. But now, when the price for sin has been paid, when the redemptive story of God is coming to a head, and when Jesus has been resurrected, Mary comes face to face with the gardener. And it's not God saying, where are you? It's Mary asking, Where's Jesus? I need to be with him. I need to know where you've put him. God's not calling out, where are you hiding in your sin and your shame? Jesus has done the work to remove the guilt of shame and sin, and now we can ask, I want to be with him. Where is he? I want to go where he's going. I want to be in his presence. I need to be where Jesus is. This tie back to the garden, John is, is tying all of this together and the words of God being inspired here want us to recognize there's not a story that's beyond redemption. There is not a life that God can't redeem. There is not sin that God cannot remove and redeem and restore in your story or in mine. But it's only when we come face to face with the gardener and recognize who he is and not run away in our shame and hide, but instead say, I just need to know where he is. I'm just, I'm looking for Jesus. Can you show me where he is? Easter tells us that every ending is just a new beginning. And I know there are stories in this room that may seem irredeemable. There are things that you have done, trauma that you have endured, pain and suffering, and maybe you've been on the giving end of that, maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. I don't know what you've been through, but God does. And your story to him, the redemption plan that he has for your life, is not a plan B. It's the only plan. In fact, from the very beginning, there was nothing else throughout all of this that was outside of the redemptive plan of God. It was all leading to Jesus coming alive that day and resurrecting from that tomb so that the story of redemption might be fulfilled where it was once lost in the garden. See, God's not okay with losing his kids. Now imagine if you were to lose your kid in a crowded area. How you would run, how you would scream, how you would get the attention of anyone who would listen to you. And you wouldn't say, well, it's been, a, it's been five minutes, it's been ten minutes, it's been an hour, we still can't find them, maybe we just call it. No, that's not how parents act. That's not how God acts. 
And so all of this was the searching, the, the reaching, the preparing the hearts of his people to come face to face with a gardener. So we could ask, where is he? I gotta know where this man is. Face to face with the gardener. Now, if you're taking notes, our final point, our third point this morning, which when a, when a pastor says, and, and finally, you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. Okay, we're about, yeah, we're, we're getting into it. Listen, turn to somebody and say, folded and finished. Folded and finished. Man, I don't know how laundry goes in your house. <laughs> it stinks. I'll tell you what, man. Laundry at our house happens like this. It's a Saturday morning. I've had a cup of coffee or two. I'm feeling good, okay? We say, I'm saying, like, it's laundry day. We're starting laundry. We got to get all this laundry done. Our bins are piled high, and, and we got to get this done. So throw it in, wash it, maybe dry it. And then if it gets dried, it gets in, and it goes back onto our bed, and we throw it there. And by that time, like, we've got a two-year-old, so she wants to do stuff, and she wants to go places, and she wants to play. So, okay, we're going to fold this up uh, tonight when she goes to bed. We'll put on a show. We'll fold this together and do it right before we go to sleep. It's a trap! Don't ever try to fold laundry while watching a show right before you go to bed because, dang it, when she gets tired and goes to sleep, I also get tired and want to go to sleep. And here's what happens with the dirty, well, now the clean laundry that's all over our bed unfolded. It goes back into the hampers, in a pile, off to the side, and we go to sleep and say, that's going to be a tomorrow problem, which becomes a next day problem, which becomes a week from now problem. And there are still clean clothes in my bin at home. I'm just confessing. Okay, this is just me understanding that when I go home today, I have to fold laundry and I'm putting it off for as long as possible. I don't know how folding goes in your house. But the details in this story, laundry matters. Laundry matters. Check this out. Verse 6 and 7 in John chapter 20. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw strips of linen laying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying in its place, separate from the linen. Separate from the linen. The NLT says it was folded and placed off to the side. Scholars and historians have uh, debated about the significance of this and, and the importance of, in the culture of where this happened. And in Near Eastern culture, uh, back in this day, what this symbolizes is when you were invited over to a guest's house and you were eating, and there were servants to wait upon the people sitting at the table. If you were done with your meal, you would take your napkin, you would wipe your beard, the crumbs out of your mustache, and you would wipe your hands, and you would put it on your plate in kind of a wad to symbolize, I'm done, you can clean up the mess now. And the, the servants would come over and they would take your stuff away and um, clean up after dinner. But if you needed to leave for whatever reason from the table to go somewhere and to come back and return to the meal... They said that you would fold your napkin, place it to the side of your plate so as to emphasize that you plan on returning to, to the, the servants so they wouldn't come and clean up your plate. And the importance of Jesus' head covering being neatly folded and placed off to the side I don't think can go unrecognized. You see, they were looking in the tomb upon the clothes that would have covered Jesus because they were looking for if this was the sign of grave robbery. Grave robbers did not care about cleanliness. They wanted to get in, take as many things that were valuable, and get out and leave as quickly as possible. And usually things would be thrown around. They were looking for the goods. But it's important to note that when they look in, there's the body coverings that's, that are laying exactly as they were, and the head covering, which is folded neatly and put off to the side. Almost as to symbolize Jesus saying, I've come, what I, I've come and I've finished what I've come to do, but I'll be back. I plan on returning. I plan on coming back for you. And you know, Scripture talks about Jesus as being the head of the body, the body being the church, what God has created as the body of Christ, which is you and I as believers. And that body is laying where it was left, the coverings of Jesus' body, but the head folded up and placed off to the side. And here's why. The head came and did what it set out to do. It has been resurrected, it has been finished, and someday it'll come back. But there's a resurrection yet to come for the body. For you and I, there is a, a resurrection that is yet to come that we get to look forward to. When Christ comes back and takes his bride to be with him. 
and this moment of anticipation. And, and so when we see the body laying there as this, as this reminder that someday we will join with the head in this finished work, but for now we just get to live in response that it is done. It's finished. And we can't fold up ours and put it off to the side, but here's what we can do. We can join in the finished work of Jesus. We can look to the head and the thing that he set out and he accomplished and he did, and we can say, I want to live in response to that. I want to live as a body in participation with the finished work of the head. Hebrews 1, so good. Verse 8 says this, and this is talking about Jesus. And, and right before this, if you want to look back, it's talking about his conquering over sin and death and, and all the powers of evil. But about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Listen, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of this earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. Listen, they will wear out like a garment, and you will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. The NLT says, and you will fold them up and discard them. Your and my reality seem really big. The things that are going on in your life seem like they are all encompassing and this is what reality is going to be like forever. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's something else that you are struggling with and this seems like it's what your life is going to be forever. What does Jesus do? He folds up all things that are under his power and his authority sets them to the side, says, it is finished, it's done. There is nothing that you and I can do that he hasn't already done. There is no work, there is no righteous life, there is no amount of good deeds that you and I can do that would add anything to the finished work of the head. Nothing. But because Christ came and he conquered death, and he finished the work he set out to do, all we have to do is recognize it and live in response to it. That's what our call is as the body. The story of Easter is the story of God's wonderful window into the divine surprise. All through scripture, God wanted to lead to this moment. He wanted to give us glimpses and little sprinkles and a taste of what this would be like for us someday. And now we get to live in response to the finished work of Jesus Christ. John chapter 20, verse, uh, verse 16 and 18. I want to draw your attention to this as we come to a close this morning. Again, it doesn't mean anything, okay? So keep your notes out. Jesus said to her, Mary, instantly she recognizes him. When he says her name, when he speaks, not woman, but Mary, when he calls her by name, she turns towards him and cries out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then at this, you know, just looking at verse 17, I, I imagine she throws her arms around him, squeezes him as tight as she can so that she would never lose him again. Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Now listen, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told him that he had said these things to her. A little Bible trivia for you. Who was the first person to sin in human existence? It was the woman. D hang on, don't get mad at me, okay? It's going somewhere. Woman, first person to sin. She takes of the fruit, Deceived by the serpent, she eats it and she passes it off to Adam. And being the numbskull he was, he said, that looks pretty good. And he took it and he ate it too. And both sinned. Who was the first person to receive the Easter message? A woman. Who he refers to as woman before calling her by her name. And just as Eve took from the tree, ate of it and passed it on, Jesus comes with a new fruit, and he says, take and eat, and take it to my brothers. 
take it to the disciples. Pass this along. Where once this action was considered shameful and and the fall of humanity and sin enters into the world this way, the gospel, the Easter message comes into the world through the same avenue. I had this question as I was getting ready for today and I asked another one of our pastors on staff, I go, why in the world don't you think the disciples were, were hanging out outside of the tomb? I mean, Jesus prophesied throughout the gospels multiple times that he would die, be a couple days, and would resurrect. And so it came down to two things. I was like, men just have short-term memory, right? All the disciples were like, oh yeah, that was today, right? Like, it happens, God, like there was, there was a couple nudges right here. Like, yeah, we have short-term memory, okay? But the other thing is, I think God appointed it that way. I think God knew exactly what he was doing, having a woman there. Someone who, who society wouldn't even credit her testimony. You know how I know this stuff isn't made up? Because that would be the last person in the world that they would have said received this message. Women could not even give their testimony in court of law. It was deemed uh, un- unbelievable. It wasn't credited to women to be able to be eyewitnesses. This is why when she sees the empty tomb and goes and tells them, they have to send two guys, one obviously faster than the other, to go to the tomb and to check for themselves to see if the story was credible. But Jesus shows up to a woman in a redemptive, active nature where a serpent shows up to a woman to deceive her. Now Jesus shows up to a woman to offer her eternal life again and to say, I want you to take and eat and respond and to take the news and tell others. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as Adam, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And T. Wright says this, the resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ. And listen, and that you and I are now invited to belong to it. Friends, there is nothing we can do to earn rite of passage into that kingdom. There is nothing that we can do, no life so good, no deed so great, that you and I can earn our way into the kingdom of heaven. You know what does that? The finished folded up work of the head of the body, which is Jesus Christ. And so when people ask, what's different? What's changed about you? It's not, well, I found this new self-help book. Well, I've started this new morning routine. Well, I stopped drinking coffee. What psychopath would do that? (laughs) So I found Jesus. I came face to face with a gardener who told me my story wasn't beyond redemption. And that because of him, I get to live a new life that has purpose, that has meaning. And that I can take this, this gospel message I've received. Listen, we're not good people. I'm not a good person. I'm just a beggar who found bread. And I'm telling other people where they can find it. And so when we receive and we eat, it's meant to be passed along. It's meant to be shared. And if you've never taken and eaten this morning, I would encourage you to. I would encourage you to ask Jesus to search your heart. Invite him in and say, Lord, if there's anything in me that is counter to your will for my life, help me to let go of it and pursue you. And listen, we're going to have baptism here at the end of our gathering. And if you feel a tug in responding in that way, I'd encourage you to step out in faith and obedience to the work that the Holy Spirit's doing inside of you. We're going to have our pastors over here. Pastor Ryan's going to come down to the stairs over here. And if you just want to come up, we have, listen, we've taken all of the guesswork out of this. We've got shirts, we got shorts, we got towels all in the back there for you. And if you want to come and if you want to respond like that this morning, I'd encourage you to do so. And we're going to celebrate with those who have made that decision. Who are going to be proclaiming an inward work of what Jesus has done in their life. And for a moment, we're going to celebrate in this room like there is in heaven. 
And we are going to cheer and we are going to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ who are making that next step in their faith. So if that, if today's your day, it's not too late. And I'd encourage you, listen, Easter is not a celebration. It is not a Sunday. It's an identity. If the resurrection doesn't happen, everything else is meaningless. If Jesus sits in that tomb and is still there and never rose from the dead, all the words today have been for nothing. But because he has, this is everything. This is everything. This is who we are. This is what we're about. This is what we preach. This is what our lives point to. Live in response to that today. Father God, as we close out today, and Lord, as we enter into this moment of celebration with those who are being baptized, God, I just pray your blessing over those who are making that decision to follow you this morning. God, that you would just become alive and real in their life, Lord. That your spirit would guide them into new ways of thinking, new ways of being. God, that they would be given gifts beyond what they could even comprehend. Lord, that their lives would be transformed because of an encounter with a risen Savior. Lord, I thank you for those who are going to be baptized today, God. That this would be a, a next step in a pursuit of you, God. That this symbolism of, of going under and coming up into new life, Lord, would be as real for them 20 years from now as it is today. Lord, we thank you for Easter. We thank you for the resurrection. And we thank you for Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, I can't think of a better way to end our gathering than water baptisms. Anybody else excited to party together? Cheer these people on. That is our custom. We just go berserk when people come out of the water. And if you're new to church gatherings or baptism, I'm just going to offer a quick explanation. Tyler alluded to it as well. It's basically telling the story of Jesus. By going under the water, you're identifying with Jesus and his death. And when you come up out of the water, it's identifying with his resurrection. And it's telling the story of Jesus. It's dying to your old way of life. And it's being resurrected into a new way of life with Jesus being our Lord. Paul puts it a different way in, uh, in the book of Colossians chapter 3. He talks about putting off our old way of life and putting on a new life. And the language is literally take your clothes off and put your clothes back on. So the earliest church communities, many of them took this thing really seriously. And they literally, before you got baptized, you had to strip naked. Trust me, we're not doing that today. But this was this vivid picture of my old life. I'm burning my old clothes. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to get a new set of clothes. In a culture where clothing was, was uh, not, not something you just throw away, this is a, a vivid picture of my old life is done. And my new life in Christ is starting anew. So we're going to celebrate. We're going to sing a song. But the focus is, man, it's just 100% on these people getting baptized. And is anyone else ready to celebrate together? That's right. Just bringing them down, down, down We've all been looking for a silver lining Something to hold on to when hope's been hiding I know a place you can go if you want to find it This is the good news If you're breathing, it's for you An empty grave, a life that's changed Nothing's been working. I've got good news. And she Take a minute, breathe it in, watch your life turn upside down. This is the good news, if you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed, it all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching, and nothing's been working.
in love with you, no matter your history. Oh, he's in love with you, no matter your
Could you all stand with us? Can we just give one more big giant celebration and applause to all those people who got baptized? Come on! All right. I think you've heard this song enough to catch on. Sing it along with us. Let's sing it out. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. we're to celebrate Easter. Amen. Well, hey, I hope you have a great Easter. I hope you have a great time with your family. But let's remember Easter is something that we live. It's every moment, every day, at our job sites, our schools, wherever we're at. So Jesus, as we go from this place, may you go with us, the power of your Holy Spirit, to live out the truth of the story, the true story that you not only died, but you came back from the dead to give us hope, meaning, purpose, everything. In the name of Jesus, we say these things. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.